Um, as I said, I'm doing a PhD in uh, neuropsychology, but mainly I'm just going to be giving a uh, psychology talk today about cognitive enhancement with a partially neuropsychological perspective. Uh, so, first thing to say is, what is cognitive enhancement? Uh, cognitive enhancement is any method by which we can enhance our own cognitive ability. Uh, now, most cognitive enhancement is therapeutic. So what we're trying to do is to take people from a H minus, I'm meaning below human average level of ability, such as they might have if they have a condition like attention deficit disorder or an acquired brain injury, which is my area, uh, up to a sort of human average kind of level. Uh, but also now there's a movement in psychology called positive psychology, which is all about, instead of studying the negative all the time, studying the positive. So how can we get people from a human average level to a kind of H plus level? Uh, and in this case, when I say H+, I really mean above human average rather than strictly transhumanist, so to speak. Okay, now there are so many different methods of cognitive enhancement that it's impossible for me to cover them all in 20 minutes. Uh, but there's a very good paper by Nick Bosterman under Sunberg, uh, which I've linked to in this talk, if you're very interested in more of them. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on five different methods of enhancement and talk about those in a little bit of detail. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is uh, brain training software, which is something that's been around a lot recently in the media. One of the things I should say about brain training software is that most of it is probably bullshit. Okay? <laughs> and the reason for this is, is that there's no evidence that it's effective. Like, as a scientist, I'm interested in empirical evidence and a good theory as to why it works. And most of it is with marketing hype. Now, the fact that there is no evidence doesn't mean that it's definitely bullshit just means that it's probably bullshit, okay? Um, however, actually I should explain how this works. Basically, the reason why it's probably rubbish is because in most things that we do, like a computer game, if we're playing Tetris, we can get better at playing Tetris. But that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get better at anything else. And one of the problems we have sometimes trying to rehabilitate people after, say, a brain injury, so you can train people to get very good at one thing, but that rarely generalises into improvement of other areas of cognitive ability. However, there is one piece of software that claims that it can increase your fluid general intelligence, which is GF, by training on a working memory task. Okay, so very briefly, working memory is your short-term memory. It's what you're using to pay attention to my presentation in now. It's not your long-term memory, which is sort of maybe what you were thinking about an hour ago during somebody else's talk. Um, the way that this task works is actually a bit tricky to explain. You're given two simultaneous stimuli. You're given a visual stimuli, which is this blue square, uh, but it could be a different colour, and it could be in, appear in different parts of this grid that you can see. Uh, you're simultaneously given uh, an auditory stimuli, a sound, at the same time, and it's called a dual end-back task. So what you have to do is left-click when the visual stimuli is the same as it was n stimuli ago. So two back would be if it was the same as two ago, three back would be the same as three ago. And likewise for the auditory stimuli. So what you've got is two separate things going on simultaneously, which you have to match to whether or not they were the same as two, three, four, five n steps back. So that's a dual end back task. Now I've tried this and I found it really, really hard. And so I agree with what someone said on an internet forum. <laughs> Until now, I've never played a game so fucking hard that the demo made me quit. <laughs> but there's an analogy here with weightlifting. Anyone could just lift a little weight and pretend they're working out, right? If you want to get more intelligent, you've got to really push yourself. So what these people claim, they've actually got some evidence behind it, which is why this one, probably not bullshit, is that the people that practice on this, so you can see we've got a notograph here, the black dots represent the training group and the white dots represent the control group. Understandably, the training group that were training this game got better at the game, which you can sort of expect. And then later on, they plotted them uh, as an increase in IQ points. And what they're saying is that over 19 days of training this game for, I think, about half an hour a day, uh, they gained five points of intelligence. And they're putting that down to fluid intelligence as well, um, which I haven't really got time to explain. But, now, I've got a few criticisms of this study, but if it's true, here's something that can increase your IQ by five points, and there just isn't anything else out there that's making that claim. Um, you could argue that they did the IQ test four times, are they getting a practice effect 
in your Q test as well. That's what I think. But maybe it's actually worked. I find it really hard. Um, final thing to say is that other training regimes of working memory have shown that people get increased prefrontal and parietal lobe activity, which are areas that we know to be critical to working memory. So I would suggest that the tests are doing what they say they're doing. Okay, so the next thing then is meditation. Now, I know one of our earlier speakers spoke quite a bit about meditation. Um, I'm going to come at this from a slightly different perspective, looking at a lot of the uh, psychological and neuroscientific evidence. So here we have a monk who's wearing uh, EEG, like scalp and face electrodes, to detect some of the electrical activity in his brain as he's meditating. And I should say this is Richard Davinson's research group in the University of Madison, Wisconsin. Okay, so psychologically speaking, a mindfulness meditation involves uh, practicing being aware of your thoughts, but in a, an emotionally relaxed and non-judgmental way. And the concentration aspect of meditation involves focusing your mind on whatever you're meditating on, normally your own breathing, uh, and letting go of intrusive thoughts. So whilst there are a lot of different meditation techniques out there, most meditation techniques have like these two elements to some extent. Okay, so what meditation does is it allows people to get better at maintaining their attention on things and inhibiting distractions. Uh, these can be internal distractions in our mind or external in the environment. And it also helps people to get better at self-regulating their emotions. And these guys tested people compared to a randomised control group that thought they were doing meditation, but really it was just a nice relaxation. Okay, uh, some of the brain changes associated with meditation is increased cortical thickness in the prefrontal cortex, which is all to do with self-control, attention and working memory. Um, increased prefrontal cortex volume again, and also decreased amygdala volume. The amygdala is part of the limbic system of the brain, which is critical to a lot of emotions, but especially negative emotions. Uh, and also increased neuro, uh, sorry, neurotransmission of dopamine, uh, and experienced meditators while they're meditating. That was important to come back to. Okay, so another reason why I think meditation is being studied so much by scientists is because of the attitude, particularly with some of the Buddhist practices. The Buddha was supposed to have said, test my teachings as you would test gold. Basically what it means is, don't blindly accept this. Test it, otherwise it might be bullshit. But anyway, <laughs> Um, the Dalai Lama has also said, if science proves that some belief of Buddhism is wrong, then Buddhism will have to change. Okay? And that's a religious leader saying this, and I think this is why they're even able to collaborate with scientists, because they've got a sort of similar kind of worldview. Okay, so currently as well, uh, if you know anything about current clinical psychology, which you probably don't, but... Uh, there are a lot of new wave psychological therapies which are trying to incorporate mindfulness into psychological therapies. So if you can get people to be aware of their feelings in a relaxed and dispassionate way, and also focus their concentration without getting distracted, they can then use all the psychological stuff from like CBT and all the other therapies more effectively. At least that's the idea, and there's people doing research into it. Okay, the next one, stimulant drugs. Everyone likes the drugs because no one wants to spend half an hour a day sitting there meditating or doing a really hard brain training game. So people just want to have a magical pill and make them cleverer. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work quite that way. There's a lot of ubiquitous stimulants like caffeine and nicotine, uh, stronger stimulants been around for the last hundred years like amphetamine, and then increasingly there are more modern pharmaceuticals like uh, modafinil. Now, a lot of stimulants seem to work by causing an increase in dopamine transmission, which, if you'll remember, was one of the things that meditation was found to do, although it's probably a lot more powerful than that. Um, they can do this either directly or indirectly, depending on the drug. Now, I haven't really got time to explain dopamine, but the thing to remember about it is that it's critical to expecting rewards in the environment, and it's also critical to focusing our attention on things. So the idea is that we focus our attention on things that we find rewarding from an evolutionary perspective, which are food, sex, and gossip. <laughs> okay, so just a little bit about modafinil then, because I don't have time to go into all of these. Okay, modafinil is used by people on board the International Space Station, but one of the reasons is that these people are working in a very complicated environment where they don't have normal day and night cycles, 
So it's useful for them to have a stimulant so they can be awake for a certain number of hours and go to sleep. And they'll be awake for a certain number of hours and go to sleep. Um, and it's also supposed to increase their performance if, for example, they're doing an 18 hour spacewalk, which is a, a long uh, work shift to ask of anyone. And it's also used by the US military, uh, especially the Air Force, because they often have people on long combat missions or people that need to be in a state of readiness for maybe 18 hours or 40 hours or something. Now, they used to use amphetamine. What they found is that it makes people a bit trigger happy. Okay? <laughs> there was an incident in which some Navy pilots uh, thought they were seeing some Afghans, bombed them, and then found out it was Canadians. And in their court martial, they said in their defense, But well, you gave us amphetamines and put us in an F 16. I'm sure they said it a bit more sensibly than that. <laughs> but, uh, in contrast to amphetamine, which can make people very, very reward driven, Modafinil primarily increases norepinephrine, which people used to call uh, noradrenaline, but it does also increase dopamine, it's been found recently. 